This summer, Gimlet is doing something new. We're having a live podcast festival here in Brooklyn. It's called Gimlet Fest, and it's two days of podcasts brought to life. And the Habitat is going to be there, too. We're partnering with Hit the Lights Theater Company to create a live, one-time stage performance. There will be music and shadow puppets and some never-before-heard audio from inside the dome. Gimlet Fest is happening on June 16th and 17th. To get tickets to our show or get passes for the whole festival, go to GimletFest.com. That's GimletFest.com for tickets. Hey guys, I'm Lynn, and you're listening to The Habitat. And we've got a bonus episode for you today. In The Habitat, we told one single story about space travel. One year, one volcano, one little group of people. But there are a lot more space stories out there. And there's one person who knows pretty much all of them. That person is the chief historian at NASA. So I was pretty excited when a former NASA chief historian agreed to sit down and shoot the shit with me. And in this bonus episode, I want to share our conversation with you. Is your uh, is your engineer over there setting everything up still and getting it? Yeah, no, he should be ready. I think we're ready to rock and roll. I had my breakfast. I had a little bit of lunch, and there was even a retirement party over at the Pentagon this afternoon, so I had to go to that, and there was cake. So this is Roger Lanius. He's doing some work at the Pentagon right now, but for more than a decade, he held the keys to the whole NASA archive. He knows every NASA mission, every NASA plan dating back to the beginning. I wanted to talk to him about Mars. Right now, the goal is to send humans to Mars in about 20 years. But Roger told me something kind of funny and kind of sad, that the goal is always to send humans to Mars in about 20 years. This has happened over and over. After the moon landing in 1969, uh, NASA uh, develops a long-range plan in which one of those missions into space would be a mission to Mars, and they thought they could do that by the mid-1980s. Huh. So it's been a little bit longer than that. Been a little bit longer than that. Uh, what's the next time frame for getting to Mars after that? Well, the next major announcement is 1989. Then-President George H.W. Bush uh, stood on the steps of the National Air and Space Museum on the, on the Mall in Washington, D.C., and announced that we were going to return to the moon and go on to Mars. Okay. And they were talking about another 20-year project, basically. 20-year project. So, okay, so it was 1989, you said? Right. Okay. So that deadline seems to have passed. Right. Okay, then what happened? <laughs> In 2004, a another President Bush, in this case George W. Bush, announced that we were going to return to the moon and maybe go on to Mars after that. It's a little bit fuzzy on that particular piece of it. <laughs> okay. And in all of these cases, they weren't exactly stillborn efforts, but they clearly were not successful efforts. All right. So what's the problem? Uh, clearly, it seems like everybody wants to go to Mars. I'd like to see people go to Mars. What's the holdup? Well, I think a lot of people would like to see people go to Mars. But I would disagree, not everyone wants to do this. Uh, and I don't just mean physically go themselves, but support it. And that's where the fundamental problem has been. It's not that people object to the idea, they object to spending the money. And one of the problems, we've seen this over and over and over again when it comes to NASA funding. Most people, if you ask them the question, do you like NASA and do you like what NASA does, They'll say, oh, absolutely, we sure. do. Sure, yeah, And, who and that, that's genuinely true. Uh, yeah, you know, I like it, you like it, lots of people like it. We all like it. Are, are we willing to double the amount of tax revenue? Do you wish your tax dollars to be spent on NASA, or do you wish your tax dollars to be spent on Social Security or the military or whatever other project you can think of? Where are you willing to take money and put it into NASA's hands to accomplish this task. And there's never been sufficient support for that to make it a reality. So what do you think would be the thing? What would get us over that hump to say, yeah, let's do it? Yeah, I don't know what the answer is. Okay. I mean, I can tell you why we went to the moon in the 1960s. All right. And that was done for a very specific purpose. The space race 
The race to get to the moon is predicated on demonstrating to everybody else, the Russians and everybody else in the world, that we have capabilities that nobody else has. From an American perspective, the Soviets had enormous capability, including atomic bombs. I mean, we feared these people. When, when and you it was say, that, sorry, when you say we feared these people, I mean, how did that manifest in your daily life? It manifests in a, in a whole variety of ways. I can remember in the early 1960s in, in elementary school where there would be regularly duck and cover exercises where you crawled under your desk like that would protect you from a nuclear blast, which we expected to happen any time, any place. And quite frankly, I thought that was stupid when I was 10. You're not going to survive a nuclear blast under your desk. But nonetheless, uh, that fear was very real. Without that geopolitical end, in other words, the Cold War environment that sparked the decision, we would not have been willing to expend the resources as a nation to accomplish it. We have nothing like that in our lives today. I mean, what if China or Russia said, or India said, you know, okay, we're going to land somebody on Mars? I think a lot of people would say, more power to you. Go with God. Ha! You think the world has changed that much? I do believe that's, that's the case. We do not fear the Chinese or name the country of your choice um, the way we feared the Russians and had a response like that. What if North Korea said we're going to land someone on Mars? Most of us would laugh. Ha! <laughs> because we didn't think they could do it. Yeah, I mean, they, and they, they do not have the capability or the economy to sustain an effort uh, to, to undertake an activity like that. Okay. All right. So that's one possible scenario, but there doesn't seem to be any immediate way that that's going to happen. What else? The other thing, and this, this is what drives a lot of people's thinking about it. Uh, you know, if we found something there that we simply could not be without, whatever that thing might be. Hmm. So what would be the thing that we would find on Mars? Medicine, maybe, if we found something there that could cure cancer? Uh, you know, conceivably. I don't have any idea what that might be, but, uh, you know, maybe there's something there that, uh, that would be of great benefit to us. And we, and we have found in human history that when there is wealth to be had, people will find ways to obtain it. That's what has sparked a lot of movement of people, a lot of, uh, of exploration and empire, uh, throughout human history, you know, is there something out there that's comparable to what the Spanish found in the Americas? Obviously, Spain sponsored uh, Columbus's voyage to what became what what we now know of as America. As America, mm -hmm. um, they immediately uh, realized that there was great wealth here, most of it in the form of gold and silver, and there were people here to subjugate and take it away from, which is what they did. Yeah, but. It made Spain the preeminent power in the world for about 400 years. All right. Okay. So what it seems like in terms of Mars, what you're presenting is a pretty cynical view, right? So the, the two <laughs> reasons that, that we've floated here that seem like really good reasons to go to Mars are, one, uh, because we're either very fearful of or very angry at another country, or two, because we want to strip mine Mars for some unknown, very valuable thing. I mean, can't we just do something because it's amazing and wonderful? We can. How many very, very expensive and difficult things do, do, uh, to do do we accomplish just for those purposes, only for those purposes? <sighs> okay. I, yeah. it, it's hard to find a lot of them. Even people who are willing to expend enormous resources individually uh, to do some adventure thing, climb Mount Everest, you name it. Um, why are they ultimately doing that? Is it for some high-minded purpose or is it about bragging rights or something else that's much more personal? And um, I, I, I don't want to be pessimistic because I would like to see this happen. It's one of the things I've, I've waited for my whole life. Yeah. But... You know, this is not my first rodeo, and I've, <laughs> I've seen these plans uh, been, uh, you know, be developed and announced and then not go anywhere, and it gets kind of depressing after a while. 
making me very sad. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not my intention. As I said, I've been, I, I feel like I've been, had the rug pulled out from under me several times. When somebody says now, and, and I know Trump has said this, we're going to go to Mars, really. What's your response? What do you feel? Show me the money. <laughs> what are you going to do to make that a reality, Mr. President? But I do believe that, you know, probably not by 2030 or in the 20s and 30s, 2030s, but certainly by the end of the century. I want to believe that somebody's going to be successful. So you still believe after all this that we're going to send people to Mars? I think we are. It's just a question of when and how many missions. Wow, because I feel like you've spent a while telling me that that's <laughs> not going to happen. And here I'm I sorry. come to find out you still believe. <laughs> I want to believe. Let's put it that way. Um, and I may not live to see it. Uh, you know, when I was a kid and we landed on the moon, I thought it wasn't going to be very long. We're going we're gonna to have at least a, a research station on the moon, maybe a colony, and we're going to send people to Mars. And, uh, and none of those things have come to pass yet. I still believe some of them will before I'm gone, but uh, probably not a Mars mission. There's another piece of this I think is important. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the most remarkable things I think has been done in space is the International Space Station. Yeah. And not because of the science on it, although there is some science being done, uh, and not because of the, you know, low Earth orbit experience of having a crew there all the time and so forth, although that's cool. What is really remarkable about it, and I would tell you 100 years from now, this is what it will be remembered for. It is the first large, international, peaceful, peaceful's cre a, a, a critical element, uh, endeavor that has been undertaken by multiple nations. And that is what it's going to be remembered for 100 years from now. Countries all over the world engaging in this cooperative venture in which pieces of the, of the station are built in all kinds of places by engineers that speak different languages using measurements that, uh, that are not common to each other. Uh, and they build this stuff, they put it in orbit, they plug it in, and it works. That is one of the most remarkable things I can envision. And I can think of nothing better as a follow-on to that international consortium than a similar consortium including even more nations, to undertake missions, I would say, back to the moon and on to Mars. You know, I haven't thought about it this way before, but now that you say that, it's because if something is so incredibly expensive that no one person or one country can pay for it, it just kind of, it means they have to cooperate on it. I mean, the fact right. of it being so expensive actually might force us to cooperate. Right. That would be one of the greatest things I can think of. And what a great boon for the world as a whole as we come together as a group to accomplish some great end. And this great end, I think, is as good as any. All right, Roger, this was so much fun. I had such a good time talking to you. <laughs> well, I had a good time. I hope... Um... I hope I didn't throw too much cold water on. No, no, it's okay. Look, I'm a, I'm a realist at heart. It's all right. Um, <laughs> thank you again. Thanks. Bye-bye. That was Roger Lanius, historian to the stars. Literally. Okay, so you've listened to all the available episodes of The Habitat, and now you're wondering what to do with your time. Well, we have some suggestions after the break. Support for this show is brought to you by Simply Safe. Home security done right. Simply Safe is designed to disappear into your home and blanket it with protection. Sensors are so small, they're practically invisible. You'll never notice them, but an intruder will. More than easy to use, it's downright delightful with gentle reminders if a window's left open and urgency in moments of crisis. Simply Safe was engineered with a single focus 
to protect. It's built for the unexpected with safeguards against storms, power outages, downed Wi-Fi, hammers, bats, and more. Simply Safe's prices are fair and honest. Professional monitoring is $14.99 a month, and there are no contracts. Simply Safe protects over 2 million homes. CNET, PC Mag, and Wirecutter have all named it their top pick for home security. Learn more about how Simply Safe can protect your home. Go to simplysafe.com slash gimlet. That's S I M P L I safe.com slash gimlet. Okay, so I've had this experience many times where I finish reading a book or I get to the end of a movie and I feel like, okay, now what? Like I was living inside this world and now it's gone. And if you've been listening to The Habitat and you're wondering what to do now, what should you read or watch or listen to, well, we have some ideas. Hello? Haley Shaw? Hi. Hi. Uh, where are you? Where are you now? Speaking to us from? I am in beautiful, sunny New Orleans, in the in the back of a bus currently. I hope it's not too loud. I don't hear anything. You're in the back of a bus. Yeah. Are you on tour? Is that what's happening? Yeah. Okay, so you're on the back yeah. of a tour bus. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Cool. Um, Haley, introduce yourself. Who are you? So I am Haley Shaw. I did the uh, created a lot of original music for the Habitat and also mixed and sound designed all the episodes. Yeah, you did. Um, <laughs> what do you want to recommend that you think people would like if they like the Habitat? So my recommendation is an album okay. by Brian Eno. Okay. Uh, called Apollo. Oh. And it was created um, in the early 1980s for, I think, a film of either the same name or a similar name. Um, so it was originally a soundtrack, but now it's just a great atmospheric album. So what is it, um, I mean, what does it sound like? It almost sounds like if you start at the beginning and you just listen through in order, it sounds like an ascent. It sounds like you're moving through different atmospheres upward. So it's like you're starting at the bottom... You're in a rocket and you're going up, 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 up through the layers until you get to, until you break yeah. through. Most recently, I listened to this album on a plane and some of those breakthroughs happened at different layers of the clouds as I was, you know, rising through cloud layers. And it was absolutely perfect for that. Perfect airplane music. What kind of, like, what feeling do you have when you listen to the album? I think when I start listening to it, I'm preoccupied with everything that's going on in my life. I'm thinking about things in the world. I'm thinking about what's around me. But I usually feel at peace when I'm listening to this album, especially when we ascend to like the cloudier, brighter moments towards the end of the album. Cool. Um, okay. Well, um, Haley, have fun on the rest of your tour, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. I'll talk to you guys soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay. Next, we're going to talk to Blythe. Blythe is here with me. Hi. Hi. Um, Blythe, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Blythe Terrell. I'm one of the editors that worked on The Habitat. Blythe, what do you think that people should check out if they like The Habitat? Okay. I have a recommendation that takes you overseas. Oh. Yeah. It's maybe a little bit obnoxious for that reason. It's a place? It's a place. Okay. Yes. So I would recommend that people check out uh, what's called the Museo Galileo, the okay. Galileo Museum. Okay. In Florence, in Italy. Um, it's a history of science museum. And it has a lot of really cool old um, scientific instruments in it. So it's got all these old telescopes and it has, it has these telescopes that ladies used to carry. In, I believe, the 18-1900s. I'm sorry, what's special about a ladies' telescope uh, as opposed to a man's telescope? Well, they were very, they were small. I assume so you could fit it in whatever kind of apparel you were carrying or wearing. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but in addition to the lady telescopes, 
they had Galileo's telescopes and all these other, you know, sort of telescopes through the, through the years. There were all these cool old globes and maps from, like, back in the day. But perhaps the coolest thing there okay. is Galileo himself. There's, like, four pieces of him. Um, which four pieces? So there is a very tasteful display okay. where you can find Galileo's middle finger, his index finger, his thumb, and one of his teeth. It's like, it's almost like this sort of like little, this religious display. Yeah, it's like relics of Galileo. Yeah, so you can go and like hang out at the altar of Galileo if you want and be like, wow, space is so cool. Thanks, Galileo. Um, yeah, so it's, but it's actually kind of cool to go there and, and see all the things that sort of led up to the scientific discoveries of today and like the ability we have to study planets from here on Earth. So everybody should buy a ticket to go to Florence. Um, and then when they get there, they should go to the Galileo Museum. Yeah, two easy steps. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Megan Tan, your turn. Hey, Lynn. Hi. What's up? Um, <laughs> do you want to introduce yourself? I am Megan Tan. I yeah. was a producer on The Habitat. Cool. Which was the bomb. Nice. Yeah. Um, do you have a recommendation for a thing that people would like? I do. Um, it's like kind of specific okay it's like really specific so i've been watching a lot of the twilight zone uh and i really love it because it it just feels like old radio dramas to me um and so there's one episode it is in season one okay and it's episode 25 and it's called people are like all over yeah and it's specifically about these two guys who jump into a rocket and they go to Mars. But the whole idea is they keep saying, we shouldn't be afraid because whatever is out there, if there's anything on this planet, I'm sure it is exactly like us. Aliens, you mean? Yeah. That is such a weird thing to say. I know. Why would he think that? I don't know. I think it's like very 1950s. Like, yeah. <laughs> like yeah, just man is the center of everything, and of course everything is like us. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of why I like it, because it's like kind of like a time capsule. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, and then, like, when they land, this guy peers outside, and there are literally, like, all these people who look exactly... Your people. ...like people. <sighs> You're just like I am. And so he, like, is like, oh, my God, you guys are just like me. You know, I'm so excited. Uh, don't be frightened. My name is, is uh, Sam Conrad. Uh, and, of course, they speak English. <laughs> Very convenient. Yeah. Don't be alarmed, Mr. Conrad. We don't intend to harm you either. Um, and then they take him into this space that looks exactly like a human home, like a, a an American home. So this is like a house for him on Mars. Yeah, okay. that they built. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, do you want me to keep going? I guess so. This is the reveal. The screens go down, and the bars, there are these bars, and he's an animal in a cage. Hey! You knocked me in! What's the matter with you people? And outside are all of these Martians, you know, all of these people peering in on him. Why are you looking at me like that? And then he sees that there's a sign, and it literally says, like, um, like, human, uh, like, in, like, from Earth in natural habitat. Yes. Yeah. And then... And it's then, a zoo. Yeah. It's a zoo. It's a zoo, and he, yeah, he's, like, the animal that they found. It's so it sounds cliched now, I feel like, because but the reason it sounds cliched is because like the Twilight Zone invented it and we've just been copying them ever since. It's so good though. Well, and then and then the line comes back and he says, People are alike. People are alike everywhere. <sighs> Different planet, same bullshit. Yo, it's it's so true though. Yeah, I kind of like that. <laughs> All right, so we gave the punchline for this one, but there's a lot more Twilight Zone episodes. People start with this one, yeah, and yeah. then they can just Twilight Zone marathon it. You really should, though. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you. Okay, so next we have Peter. Peter Bresnan, how you doing? I'm doing good. Um, Peter, what did you do on this show? I, I was the producer. 
Yeah. You did so much stuff. I did a lot of stuff. You did so much stuff. Um, what do you recommend people check out if they like the habitat? So I'm going to recommend the complete NASA archive that is available online um, for anyone to go into. Um, it's I spent a lot of time in it working on the show. Um, and it's just it, so you can go to it's archive.org slash details mm-hmm. slash NASA audio collection. Okay. Um, and it's just like a, it's not pretty or uh, it's just like a gray web page. Um, and, uh, uh, but on it is contained like 50 years of audio and transcripts from, from basically every NASA mission. <laughs> All right. So how do you suggest people attack this archive? What's the, what's the way to do it? What's the way to do it? I would say, you know, I would like do, I would, I would say bull in a China shop is the way to do it. <laughs> like go in and like just click on stuff and download stuff because like most of this stuff is, is just, is nothing. It's people reading numbers or um, just radio noise. But like there are like, I don't know, like there are these moments um, when you feel like, especially in the onboard audio where you actually feel like you are like inside the spaceship. Do you have any magical moments to share? Yeah, I do. This is Friendship 7. It's uh, blinding through the scope on clear. It's uh, started up just as I uh, gave you that mark. I'm so this is John Glenn. He was an astronaut in the very early days of the space program. And this is audio from his very first mission in 1961. Uh, have eaten one tube of food, uh, shutting the visor. Uh, have had no problem at all eating. So he's floating in orbit. He's having, a, a, you know, a grand old time. And everything's going as planned. The mission is going as planned. But then he sees something kind of strange. Uh, this is Friendship 7. I'll try to describe what I'm in here. Uh, I'm in a, a big mass of some very small particles uh, that are brilliantly lit up like they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're around the little... They're coming by the capsule. Uh, and they look like little stars. A whole shower of them coming by. So... John Glenn is looking out of the spaceship window, and what he's seeing is like what he 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 says it's like being inside of like a a big cloud of fireflies. Um, so these little like glowing lights everywhere that are sort of moving slowly around his ship. There are literally thousands of them. Eventually, what we figured out is that they were just little bits of ice and frost that are all around his ship, and the sun was reflecting off of them, and so it looked like like he said like the, like he was in a field of stars. Um, they were just floating around him. Um, and I just think that's so cool. <laughs> I just think that's the coolest thing. Um, it's so. it's pretty amazing because you can hear like you can hear in his voice just like that he, yeah, he's seeing something that he n- never expected to see, yeah. wasn't prepared to see um, that like probably nobody else has seen. Yeah. Do you think that if everybody goes, Everybody who's listening to this right now goes mm-hmm. into the NASA archives and starts looking around. They'll discover all kinds of stuff that you don't know about that we didn't know was in there. I mean, so I, I think I spent like roughly 100 hours on that web page. Okay. And I like didn't even scratch the surface yeah. of what's there. Um, and like if you, I, I don't know. I So I think that if, if someone like really gives it the time and really cares about space, like they can just like, I don't know. I think they can find so much cool stuff if they, if they, if they try. It's awesome. Yeah. Um. Do I get to make a recommendation? Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to recommend some more podcasts. Specifically, I want to recommend some podcasts from some people at Gimlet who are making stuff that I really admire. Um, So if you're into science, there is a podcast called Science Versus. Basically, the idea of the show is that they take some topic um, and they kind of break it down, okay, this is what you might have heard about this thing, these are the rumors, and then this is the real science. Mm -hmm. This is what you need to know. So there's one about nuclear war, which is kind of the biggest topic you could possibly tackle. <laughs> um, but then there's also one about balding. There, you know, these like little topics that are just things that you think about every day. I wonder how balding works. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you don't think about it every day. I think about it every day. Sure. Good. Smart. You have a nice head of hair, but you never know what's going to happen in the future. Oh, God. <laughs> So you should listen to Science Versus. I should. And they can tell you what you might have to look forward to, Mm -hmm. balding-wise. Then there's a podcast called The Nod, which I've been very into, which is about black culture. And they just take this huge topic, race, and break it down into these very engaging, interesting stories that are just kind of full of joy um, and humor. Uh, 
There was one that I really liked where one of the hosts, Eric, he got really interested in the history of grape drink and this, like, tie between grape drink and black culture. And he just went so deep. And he looked at the history of grape drink. He looked at the science of grape drink. It's just very engaging. Wow. Uh, and then I have to recommend Heavyweight. For anybody who hasn't listened to Heavyweight, Heavyweight is by Jonathan Goldstein. He is just the king of podcast writing. <laughs> He's such a good writer. He just like writes these lines that make me want to die. They're so good. <laughs> Nominally, the show is about people who have a regret or a thing that happened in their past that they want to go back and change or examine. But really, it's just about life <laughs> and and how it feels to be a human in a big world. Wow. I think. I don't know. I really love it. Every time I listen to it, I feel a new feeling. Huh. So those are some podcasts that I think are great. Cool. If you guys want to listen to some podcasts, go listen to those. And uh, thanks for listening to this. The Habitat is a production of Gimlet Media. It's produced by Peter Bresnan, Megan Tan, and me. I'm Lynn Levy. Our editors are Alex Bloomberg, Jorge Just, Caitlin Kenny, and Blythe Terrell. Music and sound design by Haley Shaw. Mixing by Katherine Anderson. Music supervision by Matthew Boll. Our credits music in this episode is performed by Sammy Miller and The Congregation, and written by David Bowie. If you like the show, spread the word on Twitter and Facebook using hashtag TheHabitat. While you're here, I want to take a minute to tell you about another show that I love. It's called Nancy, and it's a podcast from WNYC Studios about all things LGBTQ. It's full of stories about how people define themselves and the journey it takes to get there. This season, best friends and co-hosts Tobin Lowe and Kathy Tu go deep to tell you stories that no one else will. They embed with a group of students who are putting on an iconic queer play. They go in search of a long-lost rom-com called Punks, which is kind of a black, gay sex in the city. And they follow a man who's running for office to unseat the woman who denied him his civil rights. You won't want to miss this. Find Nancy on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. <laughs>